Chapter Twenty Nine of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter Twenty Nine Through an Open Window. One by one, the short winter days came and went. But they were not short to Pollyanna. They were long, and sometimes full of pain. Very resolutely these days, however, Pollyanna was turning a cheerful face toward whatever came. Was she not specially bound to play the game now that Aunt Polly was playing it too? And Aunt Polly found so many things to be glad about. It was Aunt Polly, too, who discovered the story one day about the two poor little waifs in a snowstorm who found a blown-down door to crawl under, and who wondered what poor folks did that didn't have any door. And it was Aunt Polly who brought home the other story that she had heard about the poor old lady who had only two teeth, but who was so glad that those two teeth hid. Pollyanna now, like Mrs. Snow, was knitting wonderful things out of bright, colored worsteds, that trailed their cheery lengths across the white spread, and made Pollyanna, again like Mrs. Snow, so glad she had her hands and arms anyway. Pollyanna saw people now, occasionally, and always there were the loving messages from those she could not see, and always they brought her something new to think about, and Pollyanna needed new things to think about. Once she had seen John Pendleton, and twice she had seen Jimmy Bean. John Pendleton had told her what a fine boy Jimmy was getting to be, and how well he was doing. Jimmy had told her what a first-rate home he had, and what bang-up folks Mr. Pendleton made. And both had said that it was all owing to her. "'Which makes me all the gladder, you know, than I have had my legs.' Pollyanna confided to her aunt afterwards. The winter passed, and spring came. The anxious watchers over Pollyanna's condition could see little change wrought by the prescribed treatment. There seemed every reason to believe, indeed, that Dr. Mead's worst fears would be realized, that Pollyanna would never walk again. Beldingsville, of course, kept itself informed concerning Pollyanna. And of Beldingsville, one man in particular fumed and fretted himself into a fever of anxiety over the daily bulletins which he managed in some way to procure from the bed of suffering. As the days passed, however, and the news came to be no better, but rather worse, something besides anxiety began to show in the man's face despair, and a very dogged determination, each fighting for the mastery. In the end, the dogged determination won, and it was then that Mr. John Pendleton, somewhat to his surprise, received one Saturday morning a call from Dr. Thomas Chilton. Pendleton, began the doctor abruptly, I've come to you because you better than anyone else in town, know something of my relations with Miss Polly Harrington. John Pendleton was conscious that he must have started visibly. He did know something of the affair between Polly Harrington and Thomas Chilton, but the matter had not been mentioned between them for fifteen years or more. Yes, he said, trying to make his voice sound concerned enough for sympathy and not eager enough for curiosity. In a moment he saw that he need not have worried, however. The doctor was quite too intent on his errand to notice how that errand was received. Pendleton, I want to see that child. I want to make an examination. I must make an examination. Well, can't you? Can't I? Pendleton, you know very well I haven't been inside that door for more than fifteen years. You don't know, but I will tell you. 
that the mistress of that house told me that the next time she asked me to enter it, I might take it that she was begging my pardon, and that all would be as before, which meant that she'd marry me. Perhaps you see her summoning me now, but I don't. But couldn't you go without a summons? The doctor frowned. Well, hardly. I have some pride, you know. But if you're so anxious, couldn't you swallow your pride and forget the quarrel? Forget the quarrel, interrupted the doctor savagely. I'm not talking of that kind of pride. So far as that is concerned, I'd go from here, there, on my knees, or on my head, if that would do any good. It's professional pride I'm talking about. It's a case of sickness, and I'm a doctor. I can't butt in and say, Here, take me. Can I? Chilton, what was the quarrel? Demanded Pendleton. The doctor made an impatient gesture and got to his feet. What was it? What's any lover's quarrel after it's over? He snarled, pacing the room angrily. A silly wrangle over the size of the moon or the depth of a river, maybe. It might as well be, so far as it's having any real significance compared to the years of misery that follow them. Never mind the quarrel. So far as I am concerned, I am willing to say there was no quarrel. Pendleton, I must see that child. It may mean life or death. It will mean, I honestly believe. Nine chances out of ten that Pollyanna Whittier will walk again. The words were spoken clearly, impressively, and they were spoken just as the one who uttered them had almost reached the open window near John Pendleton's chair. Thus it happened that very distinctly they reached the ears of a small boy kneeling beneath the window on the ground outside. Jimmy Bean, at his Saturday morning task of pulling up the first little green weeds of the flower beds, sat up with ears and eyes wide open. Walk! Pollyanna! John Pendleton was saying. What do you mean? I mean that from what I can hear and learn, a mile from her bedside, that her case is very much like one that a college friend of mine has just helped. For years he's been making this sort of thing a special study. I've kept in touch with him, and studied too, in a way. And from what I hear... But I want to see the girl. John Pendleton came erect in his chair. You must see her, man. Couldn't you... say through Dr. Warren? The other shook his head. I'm afraid not. Warren has been very decent, though. He told me himself that he suggested consultation with me at the first, but Miss Harrington said no so decisively that he didn't dare venture it again, even though he knew of my desire to see the child. Lately, some of his best patients have come over to me, so of course that ties my hand still more effectually. But, Pendleton... I've got to see that child. Think of what it may mean to her if I do. Yes, and think of what it will mean if you don't, retorted Pendleton. But how can I, without a direct request from her aunt, which I'll never get? She must be made to ask you. How? I don't know. No, I guess you don't nor anybody else. She's too proud and too angry to ask me. After what she said years ago, it would mean if she did ask me. But when I think of that child, doomed to lifelong misery, and when I think that maybe in my hands lies a chance of escape, but for that confounded nonsense we call pride and professional etiquette, I... He did not finish his sentence, but with his hands thrust deep into his pockets, he turned and began to tramp up and down the room again, angrily. 
But if she could be made to see, to understand, urged John Pendleton. Yes, and who's going to do it? demanded the doctor with a savage turn. I don't know. I don't know, groaned the other, miserably. Outside the window, Jimmy Bean stirred suddenly. Up to now he had scarcely breathed, so intently had he listened to every word. Well, by jinx, I know, he whispered exultingly. I'm a-going to do it. And forthwith he rose to his feet, crept stealthily around the corner of the house, and ran with all his might down Pendleton Hill. End of chapter 29 Read by The Story Girl Chapter 30 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl Chapter 30 Jimmy Takes the Helm It's Jimmy Bean. He wants to see you, ma'am, announced Nancy in the doorway. Me, rejoined Miss Polly, plainly surprised. Are you sure he did not mean Miss Pollyanna? He may see her a few minutes today if he likes. Yes, am I told him, but he said it was you he wanted. Very well, I'll come down. And Miss Polly arose from her chair a little wearily. In the sitting-room she found waiting for her a round-eyed, flush-faced boy, who began to speak at once. "'Ma'am, I suppose it's dreadful, what I'm doing and what I'm saying, but I can't help it. It's for Pollyanna, and I'd walk over hot coals for her, or face you, or, or anything like that, any time. And I think you would, too, if you thought there was a chance for her to walk again. And so that's why I come to tell ye that as long as it's only pride and et, et something that's keeping Pollyanna from walking, why, I knew you would ask Dr. Chilton here if you understood. What? interrupted Miss Polly, the look of stupefaction on her face changing to one of angry indignation. Jimmy sighed despairingly. There, I didn't mean to make you mad. That's why I begun by telling you about her walking again. I thought you'd listen to that. Jimmy, what are you talking about? Jimmy sighed again. That's what I'm trying to tell ye. Well then, tell me. But begin at the beginning and be sure I understand each thing as you go. Don't plunge into the middle of it as you did before and mix everything all up. Jimmy wet his lips determinedly. Well, to begin with... Dr. Chilton come to see Mr. Pendleton, and they talked in the library. Do you understand that? Yes, Jimmy. Miss Polly's voice was rather faint. Well, the window was open, and I was weed in the flower bed under it, and I heard him talk. Oh, Jimmy. Listening? Taunt about me, and taunt sneak listening, bridled Jimmy. And I'm glad I listened. You will be when I tell ye. Why, it may make Pollyanna walk. Jimmy, what do you mean? Miss Polly was leaning forward eagerly. There, I told you so, nodded Jimmy contentedly. Well, Dr. Chilton knows some doctor somewhere that can cure Pollyanna, he thinks. Make her walk, you know. But he can't tell sure till he sees her. And he wants to see her something awful, but he told Mr. Pendleton that you wouldn't let him. Miss Polly's face turned very red. But, Jimmy, I... I can't... I couldn't. That is... I didn't know. Miss Polly was twisting her fingers together helplessly. Yes, and that's what I come to tell ye, so you would know, asserted Jimmy eagerly. They said that for some reason, I didn't rightly catch what... You wouldn't let Dr. Chilton come, and you told Dr. Warren so, 
and Dr. Childen couldn't come himself without you asked him on account of pride and professional ed... ed... well, ed something anyway. And they was wishing somebody could make you understand, only they didn't know who could. And I was outside the window, and I says to myself right away, by jinx, I'll do it. And I come. And have I made you understand? Yes, but Jimmy, about that doctor, implored Miss Polly feverishly. Who was he? What did he do? Are you sure he could make Pollyanna walk? I don't know who he was. They didn't say. Dr. Childen knows him, and he's just cured somebody just like her, Dr. Childen thinks. Anyhow, they didn't seem to be doing no worrying about him. "'Twas you they was worrying about, "'cause you wouldn't let Dr. Childen see her. "'And say, you will let him come, won't you? "'Now you understand?' "'Miss Polly turned her head from side to side. "'Her breath was coming in little, uneven, rapid gasps. "'Jimmy, watching her with anxious eyes, "'thought she was going to cry. "'But she did not cry.' After a minute, she said brokenly, Yes, I'll let Dr. Chilton see her. Now run home, Jimmy, quick. I've got to speak to Dr. Warren. He's upstairs now. I saw him drive in a few minutes ago. A little later, Dr. Warren was surprised to meet an agitated, flush-faced Miss Polly in the hall. He was still more surprised to hear the lady say, a little breathlessly, Dr. Warren, you asked me once to allow Dr. Chilton to be called in consultation, and I refused. Since then I have reconsidered. I very much desire that you should call in Dr. Chilton. Will you not ask him at once? Please? Thank you. End of chapter 30 Read by the Story Girl Chapter 31 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl Chapter 31 a new uncle. The next time Dr. Warren entered the chamber where Pollyanna lay, watching the dancing shimmer of color on the ceiling, a tall, broad-shouldered man followed close behind him. Dr. Chilton! Oh, Dr. Chilton! How glad I am to see you! cried Pollyanna. And at the joyous rapture of the voice, more than one pair of eyes in the room brimmed hot with sudden tears. But of course, if Aunt Polly doesn't want... It is all right, my dear. Don't worry, soothed Miss Polly, agitatedly hurrying forward. I have told Dr. Chilton that, that I want him to look you over. With Dr. Warren this morning. Ah, oh, then you asked him to come, murmured Pollyanna contentedly. Yes, dear, I asked him. That is... But it was too late. The adoring happiness that had leapt to Dr. Chilton's eyes was unmistakable, and Miss Polly had seen it. With very pink cheeks, she turned and left the room hurriedly. Over in the window, the nurse and Dr. Warren were talking earnestly. Dr. Chilton held out both his hands to Pollyanna, Little girl, I'm thinking that one of the very gladdest jobs you ever did has been done today, he said in a voice shaken with emotion. At twilight, a wonderfully tremulous, wonderfully different Aunt Polly crept to Pollyanna's bedside. The nurse was at supper. They had the room to themselves. Pollyanna, dear... I'm going to tell you, the very first one of all. Some day, 
I'm going to give Dr. Chilton to you for your... uncle. And it's you that have done it all. Oh, Pollyanna, I'm so... happy. And so... glad. Darling. Pollyanna began to clap her hands. But even as she brought her small palms together the first time, she stopped and held them suspended. Aunt Polly? Aunt Polly, were you the woman's hand and heart he wanted so long ago? You were. I know you were. And that's what he meant by saying I'd done the gladdest job of all, today. I'm so glad. Why, Aunt Polly, I don't know, but I'm so glad that I don't mind even my legs now. Aunt Polly swallowed a sob. Perhaps some day, dear. But Aunt Polly did not finish. Aunt Polly did not dare to tell yet the great hope that Dr. Chilton had put into her heart. But she did say this, and surely this was quite wonderful enough to Pollyanna's mind. Pollyanna, next week you're going to take a journey. On a nice, comfortable little bed, you're going to be carried in cars and carriages to a great doctor who has a big house many miles from here, made on purpose for just such people as you are. He's a dear friend of Dr. Chilton's, and we're going to see what he can do for you. End of Chapter 31 Read by The Story Girl Chapter 32 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl. Chapter 32, which is a letter from Pollyanna. Dear Aunt Polly and Uncle Tom, Oh, I can, I can, I can walk. I did today all the way from my bed to the window. It was six steps. My, how good it was to be on legs again. All the doctors stood around and smiled, and all the nurses stood beside of them and cried. A lady in the next ward, who walked last week first, peeked into the door, and another one, who hopes she can walk next month, was invited in to the party, and she laid on my nurse's bed and clapped her hands. Even Black Tilly, who washes the floor, looked through the piazza window and called me Honey Child when she wasn't crying too much to call me anything. I don't see why they cried. I wanted to sing and shout and yell. Oh, 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 just think. I can walk, walk, walk. Now I don't mind being here almost ten months. And I didn't miss the wedding anyhow. Wasn't that just like you, Aunt Polly, to come on here and get married right beside my bed so I could see you? You always do think of the gladdest things. Pretty soon, they say, I shall go home. I wish I could walk all the way there. I do. I don't think I shall ever want to ride anywhere any more. It will be so good just to walk. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm glad for everything. Why, I'm glad now I lost my legs for a while. For you never, never know how perfectly lovely legs are till you haven't got them. That go, I mean. I'm going to walk eight steps tomorrow with heaps of love to everybody. Pollyanna End of chapter 32 Recording by The Story Girl End of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter